My guest today is an understated giant in intellect, in experience, and with that wisdom. What I like about him is that he's able to step back, look at things at a strategic vantage point, and be just as comfortable in the trench. And a lot of that has to do with character, I believe. You know, that's what makes him distinctly different. He is a risk taker. He was able to chart his own path and take a path that's not usually taken by Singaporeans. He moved away from, after being President Scholar, he was offered a position in the Administrative Service of Singapore, but he moved away from this fairly predictable and secure uh, career path to do something very different. And, and at that time, being a consultant in a, in a large consulting firm uh, would normally get a response, especially from your father, when are you going to get a real job? And he faced that. He joined McKinsey in 1980, right? And within 16 years, he became the first ethnic Chinese to, to become the uh, MD of Canada, McKinsey practice. And then several years later, he became MD of McKinsey in Southeast Asia. But that's not really the achievement of this man. For me, the achievement is he is a Singaporean who's actually had the courage and the vision to go out there and chart his own path. And that means taking responsibility for that decision. And I think he has done well for himself. And he's today a consultant for various global uh, multinational companies. Uh, he's a leadership trainer, coach. He's also an adjunct professor with the NUS Business School. I'm talking about Sia Sunyen. Sunyen, welcome. Good morning. I would like to start with uh, an interesting quotation by the current uh, global MD of, uh, of McKinsey, Dominic Barton, right? And Dominic Barton was someone you, you sort of saw through the door when he first joined. Uh, and this is what he had to say about, about you. Um, he says, Sia's value-addedness lies in posing tough questions others are troubled by but dare not give voice to. He's bold, he believes life's too short to do incremental things. He's tough, demands a lot and challenges, challenges you, comma, for your benefit. Now, it's, it's very carefully chosen words, but one thing that struck me about about <clears throat> what the current CEO, I mean current MD of, of McKinsey had to say about you is that you are not in favor of incremental changes. If you want to change, be bold and make the change, otherwise don't. My sense is that's probably one of the things that's going to hold us back in Singapore because the common word we hear is tweak. We want to tweak it here, we want to tweak it there, you know, um, don't change it fundamentally because it's worked well for us. And there's a certain logic in that, right? Because we do need some measure of continuity as we try and shift gears. But too much of tweaking also suggests a certain indecisiveness and a certain tentativeness. Uh, am I correct in making that assumption? I think it's a worldview. Uh, when I was younger, I thought I was just born with impatience <laughs> uh, and ha have to sort of uh, hold myself back with uh, sitting there with my blood pressure <laughs> escalating. Uh, and, and because I was uh, told many times to just stay low and shut up uh, by my seniors. Uh, and as I grow older, I think that uh, it is a way of looking at what will bring the best, the best outcome, the best benefit. Yep for all those who are involved. And I was very curious about very different systems, political system, history, uh, e ecology, uh, that are full of examples of how incremental solution hurt rather than benefit, even though at the point in time of decision making, it seems to give forward movement. Right. All right? So Perceptibly. 
Yeah, yeah. So I, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, a one example that just, just came to me on, on, on my way uh, mm. up here this morning. Uh, one of the places I uh, go, my wife and I go regularly, is Hawaii. Mm. And what is fascinating to me is that uh, I think uh, the policy makers, the CEOs of Singapore will do well to all take a vacation there, but instead of lying on the beach with, uh, and watch a hula show, they should sign up for the kind of the Council of Invasive Species in Hawaii. They study the problems that they inherited now of inheriting uh, the devastation of the ecology, the devastation of economy uh, and culture. Uh, so in, in fact, pervasive uh, damages uh, for, for uh, animals, plants, uh, ocean species, and so on. It's, it's a perfect study mm. of the, the, the deleterious effects of, of incrementalism. Let me give you an example. So when the uh, sugarcane industry flourished uh, in Hawaii, uh, workers are imported from Japan, China, uh, even as far as Portugal and so on to come work in the fields. And with these ships come fuel mice, mm -hmm. which become a menace. A menace yeah. So the incremental solution was, was uh, people thought was very clever. They introduced mm -hmm. one after another of animals. Right. So initially they, they intru introduced a kind of bird called molad uh, that supposedly um, might, uh, you know, keep the population of rats down because uh, at that time perhaps they are smart enough to know the poison may not be good for mankind. <laughs> Lo and behold, the moilat, uh, the bird is a kind of uh, duck family, mm. grew exponentially in the wonderful climate of Hawaii, but the rat population also grew. <laughs> they said this cannot be. Yeah. So they introduced the next incremental solution, which is snakes. <laughs> we all know in Asia that snakes, uh, you know, love to eat uh, rats. However, the snakes also eat birds, Yes, they eat uh, you know, plants, and, 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 and so on. So these examples, uh, if you really go and listen to uh, what the, the park rangers and scholars uh, have to say, which I always make a point to visit a part of the ecology to better understand the world that we're living in and what our incremental decisions in the past yeah. and how that affects us today. Yeah. And I mean, what, what, you've, what you're sharing is, is, is fabulous because <clears throat> if you want to keep the, the mainframe intact, but attack it on the sides, you may cause a lot more harm. Right. Even right? though in, in it looks process. like, you know. It looks like you're solving the problem, but you may cause a lot more harm and it could be a slow and painful death. Right. Right. So some people have argued that city states like Singapore have a unique evolutionary challenge. Mm. Right, yes, which, which, is, which is very different from a country, right? We are a city and a state. We have a very different pathway and a different set of challenges. And one of the challenges we face is that, like all human beings, we are, we are creatures of comfort and habit. Change is disruptive and we try our best to avoid it, right? And <clears throat> so anything that is disruptive, anything that is negative, that challenges, we try and push it away because we want continuity. Tweaking gives you that sense of comfort and pacing of that continuity. But the clock is ticking. You have often, last time we sat down, we talked about the, the necessity to accept that sometimes conflict is necessary for revolution. Not necessarily violent, but revolution. Fundamental shifts. How valid is that argument? It is disruptive. Yeah. <clears throat> I think we, we are blessed uh, with uh, the, the success of, the, of, of as an economy, as a political system, as a society. Uh, and part of that success is to actually propel us yeah. into no man's land. So some people will say, we're, well, congratulations, we're a first world country. So now, which political system or a first world country might we copy mm. to, to, to for our next uh, step forward? Now, 
what the what about our healthcare? What about our social policies? You know, for better or for worse, we're in no man's land. And in no man's land means that incremental solution, which is to study how, for example, uh, nine uh, countries in the world uh, regulate their electric utilities, mm. well, which one of these regulatory regime might, might work well for us, is the wrong way to start. Mm. Because we got to start with what we got. Yep. And uh, recognize the fact that we are unique and we are where we are, not arrogance, mm. but looking at the problem at the right level and be able to confront uh, the, 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 the various views and, and see where they can come up with uh, the best solutions for everyone. So there are really two principles that are involved. One that I find very interesting and I've been thinking about is this notion of harmony versus cohesion. Yeah. And the second one is addressing uh, the problem at the right level. Yeah. So let me take each one in turn. Uh, we as Asians, and not just Singaporeans, love harmony. harmony. If you look at the feudal system in China, right? The concubines and the, the, the you know, may fight, but when, the, when the, the, the Lord comes home, everybody sort of try to, try to pretend that things are going on harmoniously. So there's harmony, but there's no cohesion. Not one heart, one mind, one purpose. Yeah. So I think we are at the stage where I would dare to, po to posit this notion that in Singapore, we probably should talk more about cohesion than harmony. Yep. Harmony could inadvertently promote, you know, sweeping the problem underneath the carpet for the sake of harmony. That means that, oh, you know, we're civil to each other, well, we're peace, peaceful and calm and, and so on. But in some of the issues, as the world gets more complex, as we are in a no man's land, etc., are so multivariate that you have to be able to confront the issues and be able to address it, even bring it into a conflict yeah. in order to resolve it. To force it. To force it. Force the issue in order to arrive at a cohesive one mind, one heart, one purpose outcome. It's interesting because <clears throat> At, a, at an integration conference in Singapore, I presented a similar idea to say, <clears throat> when we talk about racial and religious integration in Singapore, we have done well in focusing on harmony because it's allowed us to continue with progress, economic progress and so on, right? But there comes a point when you have to ask yourselves, in making sure that all the pieces are in place and don't move too much, politically correct, socially correct conduct, conduct and interrelations may not actually build, may not necessarily deepen trust. Mm. At some point, and I feel that this is the point where we've got to start forcing some of the inconvenient questions so that the, the trust is deeper, not just surface level. Right. And, and it's similar to what you're saying. So in the, in the area of race and religion, which is today very, very critical, you know, do you feel that that sort of thinking is necessary? It's risky. It's risky. Question is, as you said just now, what is the appropriate level? What do you mean by that? What's the appropriate level of intervention? The appropriate level means that, you know, in order to avoid incremental solutions yeah. that uh, do more harm than good or, uh, at the, you know, at best, uh, provide the superficial progress yep. uh, that is neutered uh, over time. Uh, addressing the problem at the right level means that, you know, we need to look at problems much more like holons. Now, I wouldn't get into the theory of holons. Holons are really things that uh, recognizes the... Holon is spelled H-O-L-O-N. H-O-L-O-N. Mm. Yeah, and the study of it is called holarchy, mm -hmm. okay? And there's a whole body of knowledge out there. Right. Right, now it is relatively unknown because I was fascinated by the fact that our education system based in the West are entirely almost driven by the opposite, which is by the, the, the idea of analysis uh, and logic. synthesis, logic and synthesis. Yep. 
uh, analysis, which means breaking things down into, into manageable chunks. Yeah. So when I say this cup is uh, white, we can isolate the word white and say, okay, now how white is white and is subject to analysis, yeah. right? Yeah. Is it whiter than your jacket, for example? So now this goes all the way to Greek civilization. So we're not here to talk <laughs> about that. But what's interesting is that we're so schooled in it and so conditioned to break things down that we're not very good in synthesis, mm. which is to put it together and look at the problem at the right level. Whereas hold on is to say, listen, uh, we're in this studio. This studio is in this particular uh, complex, which is in this part of the campus or NUS Kenridge Ken campus, which is a part of this whole area of Singapore, uh, you know, and which is all a part of Singapore and, and so on and so forth. These are successive rings of reality and each successive ring, if you will, incorporates but never give up the detail and the truth that's embedded in its pre uh, yeah. predecessing uh, predecessor uh, rings. Now, why is that? You know, the world is ho uh, full of holon. Human beings are holon. A flock of Canada geese is a holon, mm. right? Mm. And, uh, and and it's a social holon, in, in fact. Now, why that is important is that because if you are looking at a problem at the right level, and I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, the the the, the you know you, you open up the Straits Times. Every morning, it is full of holonic problems. Mm. The, the recent one that caught my eye, and it's a good place to start, is the, the plight of the so-called Orchard Road uh, mm. uh, malls, right? Being the granddaddy of mall in Singapore, it, it, it had uh, a great reputation overseas for uh, tourists and, and locals alike, except that over time, in fact, in the last 15, 20 years, Orchard Road is struggling to maintain its vibrancy and, yep. and, 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 and the premier status, uh, losing out to the suburban mall and uh, technology. Now, so the latest problem is that URA is bringing grants for all these pedestrian underpasses and so on and so forth and try to help retailers and, 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 and department store uh, and developers. Yeah, developers and owners mm. to sort of have a more vibrant right. uh, thing. However, they were surprised that no, there was no takers for the grant. So what is going on? And if you look at the comments in many of the interviews, people are looking at, you know, you, you mean, okay, you give me a grant, I, you know, we build this uh, underpass, but I have to maintain it, so my cost goes up. If I look at my, uh, my P&L, this does not make any sense. Yeah. But, if you, but nobody is looking at it at the overall Orchard Road area. And so I say, if we all do, it not just one underpass, but complete overhaul of what Orchard Road actually means. What kind of audience, right, might, might, should it appeal to? Uh, should it go well beyond just eating and, 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 and shopping, yep. <laughs> for, for example? Uh, then, then they might attract a whole lot more footfalls, a lot more uh, 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 fl uh, traffic flow of, of people yep. coming through here that lift the entire economics so, of, of the system. So what, what, I'm get, what I'm hearing is, is, is a confluence of some of the points that we have raised so far. Number one, incremental change is not a bad thing, but is not always a good thing. Yeah. Right? There needs to be someone who looks at it, you know, holistically and say, no, that's not the appropriate level. We need to shift it to significant change. Right? Otherwise, you'll just continue the way it is. Right. Right. Now, all that boils down to what I'm hearing is an aversion to anything that's overly disruptive. Keep what's worked going. But that, in today's world, need not always work. Right? So, so we need to now step back and ask ourselves, what is preventing what is likely the danger to be the danger in preventing Singapore from continuing to attain a certain level of greatness? Okay. I would put it to you that it all points to leadership. The right kind of leadership that fits the bill for the season. What's your view on that? Well, I, I you teach uh, leadership. 
Yes, uh, one of the things that I think is inevitable here is that why is this happening? It's happening because of our success. Our success is, is in fact, uh, uh, in a sense, our liability uh, in so far as yes, this yes. phenomenon is concerned. Because change is painful. We, we are facing the unknown. It's on the orchard road. If, if I go make this speech to the mall owners and say, oh yeah, it's easy for you to say, you know, you're a thinker, you're a professor, you're a consultant, right? But I got skin in the game. I got my capital mm -hmm. in here. And, and what if we spend all this money and, you know, the thing doesn't work? So it always has a very large measure of uncertainty and a leap of faith into the unknown. Yeah. You don't need leaders. You need managers to say, can you make the PL 5% better next year? Right. Just manage what we got. Yeah. Make sure you keep the wor good workers attract one or two more, right? Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Somebody needs to keep all of you that do money. You need a significant yeah. number of people. But, you know, in the kind of problem that in a landlocked place like ours with, you know, all the success powering uh, the expectation of our populace, yeah. right? We got to change to embrace the unknown, the uncertainty. So what does that call for? It calls for leaders. Leaders are the only ones who sort of say, okay, we are no longer able to look at the rear view mirror, run numbers and be able to say, you know what, if we do all this, Orchard Road will be, the, you know, will be 10 times uh, more successful than, than the past. Somebody has to make a leap, has to have the call for people to follow that vision, to embrace that vision uh, that basically has a very strong dose of uncertainty. If you have to pick three fundamental qualities that differentiate the kind of leadership that we need in Singapore today compared to managers, what would those three be in order of importance? The, f the first thing that comes to my mind, I mean, I don't know what is order of importance, the first thing that comes to my mind is the simultaneous ability to see things at the right level of, of the whole long, right level of the problem yeah and be very steeped in the trenches of the, the right level of detail yeah and no detail today is detailed enough yes that's the first quality and 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 you know a local example that is continued to be inspiration for me is uh, mr. Lee Kuan Yew yeah. uh, I've interacted with him I uh, had the privilege to do so while at McKinsey and there's no doubt that he personifies that quality for, for me. Yeah. Now, let's stick to that for a, for a short while. It's mm -hmm. a very important point you made. The ability to stand back, look at things from the vantage point, the helicopter view, and very quickly jump into the trench, fight the fire, and then know when to step back. Mm -hmm. You know, In warfare, someone who epitomized that was Patton. Mm -hmm. Patton was a, General Patton was able to do that MacArthur wasn't, mm. right? I mean, I would draw the, the correlation between the two, and you are familiar with these two characters. Right. right. Patton had the ability <coughs> to jump into the trench, rally the crowd, show them how to do it. He was able to f actually demonstrate how to fire the weapon, mm. enough to inspire them, but not stay longer than necessary, mm. because he was really needed back there to look at the strategic view. Mm. So a key part of this is knowing when to jump out of the trench. Mm. Would you say that that's a quality that we need to harness in Singapore? Absolutely. I, I think one of the things that mm. I, I see in my, uh, one of my activities, which is to counsel yeah. uh, chief executive officers and succession candidates yeah. of uh, Singapore companies, large companies, uh, is that for we, we somehow have managed to sort of groom a generation of up and comers that are excellent at operation? Yes. Now, that, y you know, is incredible uh, and is very, very valuable because yep. you f without the ability to operate a business, you will never get efficient, you never get productive, you can never turn the crank well enough to make profit, if you will, quarter to quarter. Yes. But if that's all we do, we are growing beyond what our market can sustain. 
there is only that much blood you can squeeze out of stone. Yep. You have to be successful in the global stage. And being successful is no longer just making the stuff and ship overseas. We haven't got any stuff that we can take out of the ground yes. uh, to ship overseas. So we have to go there mm. and do, uh, fight the market battles uh, uh, with technology and win the customers one at a time. Now that kind of leadership will require people who are able to rise to the right level or looking at where are the sweet spots in terms of what we have to offer and be able to personify that confidence, that strategic vision, that stature, that presence, right? Presence. Presence. Yeah, that, that's so important. I mean, you've mentioned that in many of our conversations. Mm. <clears throat> I mean, it, it, it's not just about persuasion, right? No. It's about presence, and, and that you either have or you don't. Would you agree? Well, presence. You, can you build it? More, yes, absolutely. You can nurture it. You can nurture. You know, it's just like uh, you know, you, you, I may not be a Mozart, but uh, I try hard enough, and boy, I, I can I can get LSE one and two in piano. Okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll hold you to that. Yeah. I'd like to see a demonstration of that. But presence is when you walk into a room, mm. people actually sense your presence. Mm. They look at you, mm. right? Now, my own sense, we don't have enough leaders with presence. Mm. Because it was not valued before. It was not. It was a concentrated society where a few leaders, commercial and political and social, are able to carry the day in a very small, small economy and small society. Right. It's good enough, right? Now, several of our leaders, including Prime Minister Lee Sen Loong, has lamented that we have a dearth of talent. We have a dearth of talent. Is that true? That we, or are we looking at the wrong places? Yes and no. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes means to say if you sort of just look at what we have versus what we, the demand of the quality and quantity. Mm. Uh, he's right. That's a deficit. Yes, it's a def def definite deficit. And that is a phenomenon that I looked at in the mid 90s. Uh, well, it hasn't, it hasn't changed. Hasn't yeah. changed. In fact, the gap, if anything, is, is wider. Op opening wi wider. But the opportunity is to say, I've always believed in the human potential to be able to improve, not just the hard skills, but also the soft skills of end qualities. Yeah. In today's world, you go to Wikipedia and your knowledge can improve, right, in 15 minutes. It's not the same, you know, if I know nothing about chemistry, in 15 minutes I can learn something about chemistry. Enough to have a conversation. Yeah, right? Yeah. But I cannot ride a bike in 15 minutes. It will take me weeks, right? With an excellent teacher nurturing and supporting and challenging, I might be able to learn it faster and, you know, save a few scrapes on my knees, <laughs> right? But to have good judgment, the right kind of creativity, the good presence, you take months and years. Yeah. And a constant work, yeah. lifelong work. See, there, there we are. And you ask the question, what's our education system focused on? Now, we have made huge stride. Now we're talking skills future. Yeah. But why not quality's future? Yeah, why skills? Right. Skill is important because a lot of the things at the at the at the at the core phase of the at the point of break, make or break is all about skill. Yeah, it's not what you say; it's how you say it. Yeah. For instance, mm -hmm. right? It's not that you I know the rules and know the score of the last Wimbo, uh, last uh, nine uh, Wimbledon finals, mm. men or women. Mm. It is how well am I going to hit the ball when when it comes into my side of the court. Yeah. It's skill. But at the end of the day though, when you're competing at that level, it is also beyond skill. It is qualities. Yeah. What is that sense of grit? The sense of culture, uh, of, of courage? Uh, and character. Of, the, the character, yeah. 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 Now you mentioned character on a, on, a, on a couple of times. It is a topic that you know, uh, I've been fascinated by. And it's close to your heart. Yeah. It has not been, you know, something that people had taken for, for granted. Uh, it is very important. And it is very pertinent to what you do, Wiswa. And, and, and character is a set of principles that one adopts as a way of coping with the challenges of the world. Right. 
and particularly are principles that you adhere to at the most inconvenient moments. Yeah. On a fine day like this, sitting here, you know, we can talk about, like, you know, part of my character is I don't believe in stealing or cheating mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. whatever it is. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. But if, uh, you know, when the, if the world is running out of water or running out of this or that, or there's somebody puts uh, a billion dollars uh, in front of me, would I still not cheat or steal? It is very inconvenient. Very, very. And, and <coughs> one of the things that, that has always fascinated me is in a crisis is where you see real leadership. You know, in, in a good day, you can say, these are the five values I believe in. Mm. Humility, compassion, mm. integrity. Mm. But in a crisis, when the chips are down, everybody is watching the leader and seeing how this person conducts himself. Right. And that acid test sometimes is what is missing. I think when things are so smooth. So we are not used to, we are not used to disruption. It goes back to your point about, you know. I mean, recently I was talking to somebody and said, you know, that, that there is an interesting correlation between uh, resilience and efficiency. Mm. An inverse correlation, if you, if you ask me. If you've had the benefit of efficiency and smoothness for a long period of time, in a certain predictability and successful management, your, your requirement to be nimble and to be alert goes down. Your resilience could go down, all things being equal. You know? In some countries, you say that things are moving in spite of the government. And in these countries, the people take responsibility for what happened. They're not going to wait for the government to come and solve the problem. So as you said just now, our success is actually the, the thing that's holding, that could hold us back. Question is, leadership is the answer, but how do, we, how do we actually build it? One is to import leaders, right? The other is to ensure that we harness what we already have. Yeah. How do we do the latter? No, I think to start with, one has to believe. Yeah. One has, the, the, the sitting leaders, corporate, social, political, it like has to be, has to believe that our leaders at every level. Yes. And leadership given, my definition of leadership, by the way, is not position of power. Yeah. It's not even title. Yeah. But because crisis can happen to a patient at it, 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 one of the most remote wards in the hospital. Yeah. Right. The CEO of uh, the Singh Health System is not, leadership is not going to help that particular patient. It is a crisis. Yeah. So then the question gets to be who at that time can exercise discretion and so I'll say, you know what, I'm going to do this, right, because I really believe in trying to save the patient yeah. and, 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 and whatnot. So I think opportunity of leader, ex exercising leadership exists wherever there is cr the potential of crisis. And you and I know Crisis can happen at every inch, yeah. anywhere, anytime yeah. in the world. It's not if, it's when. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. the call for leadership and the supply of leadership has to happen everywhere and at every level. That's the big point. If you don't believe in it, you will be resigned to, his, to lamenting the fact, ah, oh, you don't have, don't have enough good leaders. Yeah. I know. I don't trust uh, beyond these two hands of people. Yes. No, not enough good men and women. Who can I appoint now? You know, Sun Yen. I don't know. You know, he's a strange, a strange bird. He, he he behaves strangely. You know. So if you have that mindset, you will live forever with uh, def uh, deficiency. Yeah. No. Can, can I can I pick on that? You, you're a president scholar, president scholar, Colombo plan scholar, right? So if you stayed on in Singapore and stayed on the administrative service, chances are you'd have been permsec or something by now. Now, the question here is, are we looking specifically at a certain breed of people to qualify as leaders? You know, I.e., if you are a PSC government scholar, administrative 
not that they aren't, they, aren't, they aren't good leaders, but based on what you said, if we just focus on this group of people as your catchment for leadership, I think we are shooting ourselves in the foot. Because as you said, in a hospital situation, the nurse on the ground or the attendant on the ground may be required to exercise leadership and may demonstrate greater leadership in the exercise of discretion than the chairman of the medical board. Not may, is. is. So, you know, if you don't believe me, just go <laughs> hang yes, around, I, I know what hang I mean. around a ward. And who, is, who, who are the leaders? Who, who are the leaders? Right? There, there, are, there are leaders that it could be a nurse, yes. could be a medical attendant. It's not necessarily the big doctors. So if you look at it, if you just focus on one very small catchment of people, mm. right? We are actually shooting ourselves in the foot because there are a whole spectrum of people who have the ability for leadership, but if you do not acknowledge and recognize it, that leadership actually fizzles. Mm. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think the key is really we need to A, recognize and give the right person the right break yes. at the right time. Now, how do we do that? It, that requires a second. You know, the first one is recognize that leadership yeah. challenges and opportunities everywhere. Second is a fundamental belief everyone is a leader. The third is that without opportunity, there's no leader. Absolutely. There's right. no ability to demonstrate that yeah. leadership. So the question is, you know, I see Wiswa walking by and I say, hmm, if I can give him a hand, uh, you know, what is the next size of opportunity that will be perfect for him? Yeah. Who is to say? He, he might be even think so, but let me try and convince him that his best calling is the challenge that I have in mind. The society needs it. It is going to be better once he tried it, then whatever he's doing right now. That mindset is absolutely important because we don't have any opportunity to exhaust all the challenges and opportunities that require leadership to, in today's world. And would you say that that's an area that we as a society probably need to pay a lot more attention to? Giving yes. breaks, as you said. Yep. And it's an excellent way of putting it. Giving individuals a break. You know, it's not about passing it forward necessarily. You know, you know the kind of, that sounds like charity. Mm. This is about looking at a brethren and saying, this guy is struggling, but he's not giving up. There's something in him that keeps him going. Mm. I want to go there. And I've got to tell you a story. Yeah. And uh, we do apologies to not having asked for permission beforehand, but the no. mm. it's a Singaporean story. Mm. Uh, one of uh, a person I have got privilege to know is Professor Sukiji. Yep. Right. And he's uh, the head of our National Cancer Center. And I have asked him after a glass of wine and so after a while and so I say, you know, why don't you follow your, some of your brethren and mm. go to the proverbial Orchard Road <laughs> and into private practice and you, you, you make a heck of a yeah. lot more moolahs exactly. than, you know, the nice, you know, decent pay that the, 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 the service is giving you. And to make a long story short, he told me this. You know, beyond, hey, I get to do interesting work, I get to do research and so on. Hey, come on. If you, wanna, if you don't want to do that, like many Canadian uh, doctors, they will fly south. United States is full of money, full of interesting yeah, cases, yeah. right? Everything. So it is not that. He says, you know what? It boiled down to when he was a medical student and as a Singaporean at that time in the Australian policy, you cannot get an internship. Yeah. All right. So how are you going to be a good specialist if you don't get internship? You know, you can study all you want. And his professor took a look at him and broke the rules and gave him a break. So some poor Australian, because you know, would not have given the given a chance, may have to take another, you know, go to another university or you know, I don't know what the specifics were, but he was given a break, and that not only made him become a successful doctor, it also become a devoted mentor. Right. I was given a break, and therefore, it is in my blood to try to give the right people, the deserving people, 
as much breaks as they deserve. The same, the same thing with me. Yeah. When I started, I was the only ethnic Chinese in a blue-blooded firm. Today, we got thousands of, of Chinese, yeah. uh, you know, of all description in, the, in, in McKinsey. But when I first started, if it had not been for one or two mentors who sort of said, you know, this China man may look, <laughs> sounded strange, look strange, <laughs> spoke with a stammer, or was yeah. Chinese educated yeah. in Catholic yeah. high. And so I say, you know, beyond a good brain, he's got a good heart. Let me, let me see what he's made of. Mm. And gave me a break. I wouldn't have devoted the rest of my life to mentor people like I am right now. That's, that's really inspiring because it's, it's inspiring to hear someone like you say that hand to heart. Because we need that. We need that so desperately in Singapore. And I feel that we should stop looking at my share in the pie. We should start looking at how we can make the pie larger. Even if my share is bigger, your share is likely to be bigger too. Mm. It's about making the pie. Now that's larger. a profound thought. I don't. I wonder how many. I I have met leaders in Singapore, that. not that many, who have started to think along those lines, mm. and for precisely the reason that you mentioned, Sun Yen, because they got a break because somebody, somebody, believed in him, mm. and say, I believe in you, in spite of all the warts and and you know and and inconsistencies and not getting straight A's. You didn't get your O levels, you didn't do extremely well. No. Right? Terribly. You had a whole <laughs> spectrum, you were what, from A to D seven, you know. Yeah. But one to seven. One to seven. <laughs> but you had a second chance. A levels you did well and then you got your president scholarship and so on. And the world is full of people who are prepared to give you a break. Mm. But first of all we need to believe in the human spirit, mm. even if that person disagrees with you. Yeah, right. and if we, you see, you, uh, you touch on a very important idea, which is that when, when somebody gave me a break, and in gratitude, I give others break and invest in others with no expectation of return. Yes. You see, that is the definition of mentoring. Yes. Otherwise, it's a transaction. Absolutely, it's, it's, right? it's with no expectation or return. And, and when that happens, yeah. you touch somebody's human spirit. And human spirit, as we know, is when they soar, they can do the impossible. Yeah. Well, we need to wrap soon, but I'd like your final thoughts still on this, on this point, right? Which is leadership mm. is distinctly different from managing and you need to give people, you need to accept and acknowledge that leadership can be, can be present at all levels in the strata. And you need to recognize and give the opportunity to demonstrate it, the break. Mm. What do you think is the fundamental mindset issue that Singapore as a society, not just a government, but as a society, we need to fight against to achieve that? I will say one word that comes to my mind, humility. Okay. Humility. Uh, you know, success uh, breeds uh, a lot of sentiments, some of which is good and some of, some of which are dangerous. Yeah. Uh, complacency, for instance, uh, pride, uh, and all of that speaks against humility. Yeah. When you are most successful, that's when you need to be most humble. In your experience, in all these years as a consultant, working with large and small companies all over the world, how did humility feature? The, the, the finest leaders I've met are most humble to learn from the smallest person and in fact their attitude is you know I don't know enough what I don't know and that's very dangerous so you some stranger can be the my teacher 
and they are genuine about that. See, for, to really believe what it takes to believe everyone is a leader is that you have to be humble, genuinely humble, not kind of... Not a, false humility. Not more false humility, uh, which we have, we have our fair share of. Uh, but genuinely believe that I'm no better than you are. And the next turn of phrase, you can teach me something that I had never thought of. And on only then, you can discover how you can take your game up another level. Because by definition, if you thought about it, you'll be continuing to progress. We don't have, we don't have this plateauing problem. We don't have this plateauing problem on our productivity. We don't have this plateauing problem on our growth. Yeah. We don't have this compl uh, complicated uh, 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 problem of, of, of grid locks right, in many of our issues. It's because someone who is holding the power and the authority is not humble enough to see the problem that is a there is a different voice, a different way of looking at problem, a different level of looking at the problem, a, a level of detail that perhaps uh, was missed that could spin the problem on its head. And I think this quality is more important today never before I think because of our success because of our success and because of the complexity of the environment yeah with so many moving parts right and my own experience <coughs> I can tell you with some it's something that you would be able to relate to in OCS officer cadet school doing mm. the national service went for jungle training in Brunei mm. as a platoon commander after I passed out you know, and we have this idea, you know, when you're 18 years old, you're a second lieutenant, you have this, this feeling of grandeur, you know. Pip and on then, your shoulder. Yeah, pip on your shoulder and then had 30 soldiers and I was lost. Mm. We were going in circles in the jungle. But I, I didn't have enough humility to accept, to acknowledge to my platoon that we were lost. I knew we were lost, but I didn't want to acknowledge it. They knew that I was lost. But they were, they were supportive of me. And then finally, we were in circles for 24 hours. We were exhausted. We didn't have enough water. My soldier with primary six education came up to me and said, Sir, I think I have a solution. My immediate, my immediate response to him in my mind was, I went to RI, I spent nine months in OCS, and you with not even PSLE education, you are here to try and teach me. That was what was going through my mind. And I, had, I probably had a smirk when I told him, all right, show me what you have. He was the guy who got us out of that situation. Mm -hmm. That was a life-changing moment for me because I realized how flawed I was. Mm. No, I think your example was perfect illustration of what I just said. Yeah. Which is that if you are of the mindset that, you know, at the next turn, somebody that you, is not your usual suspect or wisdom is going to tell you something that will solve your problem. Yeah. And he did. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean this, the world is full of opportunities like that. And, and, and you know, you know we, gotta, we gotta do that more in our schools. Yes. To teach people, not just in terms of book knowledge and now skills, but also the next frontier, which is quality. Yeah. Humility is not a skill. Humility is a quality. And quality, I'm in the business of trying to make more leaders faster, better. I can tell you it's going to take years, if not decades. Yeah. We better start now. On that note, I'd like to thank you very much, Sun Yan. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome.